Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming, especially for braving the cold to be here on this really important day. Um, before I begin, I would like to officially remind you that Yale is committed to protecting free expression and peaceful dissent. Interfering with the speaker's ability to speak and the audience's ability to hear is not consistent with the university's free expression policies. Okay, so on behalf of the Yale School of Public Health, Winslow Medal Committee, its chair, Melinda Irwin, and nominating professor and chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Trace Kershaw, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome you to this eighth conferment of the CEA Winslow Medal by the Yale School of Public Health. And we're conferring it on Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. You're going to get a lot of applause today. Uh, the Winslow Medal is given in honor of the founder of our school, and many would say the founder of public health in the United States. It is considered our school's highest honor. It is awarded to world-renowned in innovators and distinguished careers and outstanding achievement in public health leadership, scholarship, and contributions to society. Past recipients include Sir Richard Dahl, Dr. William Fagey, Sir Ian Chalmers, Michael Marmot, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Dr. Judith Roden, and Dr. Linda Birnbaum. Before introducing Professor Crenshaw, I'd like to give you a little bit of background of the award and CEA Winslow. He was born in 1877 and received his bachelor's and master's of science degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1898 and 1899, respectively. He taught at the University of Chicago, the City College of New York, Columbia, and Yale, and served as the editor of the Journal of Bacteriology and the Journal of the American, uh, the American Journal of Public Health. He was president of the American Public Health Association, which defines public health and Professor Winslow's words to this day. In 1920, Winslow set forth a definition of public health. He said, public health is the science and art of preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting physical health and efficiency through organized community efforts for the sanitation of the environment, the control of community infections, the education of the individual in principles and personal hygiene, the organization of medical and nursing services for the early diagnosis and preventative treatment of disease, and importantly, the development of the social machinery which will ensure that every individual has a standard of living adequate for the maintenance of health. Organizing these benefits is set in such a fashion as to enable every citizen to realize their birthright of health and longevity. Winslow sought to move the field of public health in new directions based upon his belief that public health was not a static discipline or a sanitary science, but rather a social science. According to Winslow's view, public health was emergent, optimal, and mutable. It included not only infectious disease control, but also the prevention and control of chronic diseases such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, mental illness, diseases of infancy, and those diseases associated with poverty. At Yale, Professor Winslow was chair of the Department of Public Health at its inception in 1915. In the course of his 30-year tenure, he brought Yale, the department, and himself considerable international and national distinction. During this time, hygiene developed into preventative medicine, bacterial, bacteriology evolved into parasitology and virology, classic epidemiology evolved to include clinical epidemiology, and the control of communicable diseases expanded to include chronic and acute non-communicable diseases. And public health was at the heart of a focus on the social determinants of illness and health equity. Winslow developed public health into a premier educational program that graduated not only students with master's and doctoral degrees in public health, but also medical students imbued with this preventative spirit. Yale was the first academic institution in the US to establish a degree-granting program in the field. In 1946, the program was among the first eight schools to be nationally accredited as a school of public health by the American Public Health Association. The American Public Health Association has declared that racism is a public health issue and it is a public health crisis. In order to advance racial equity and justice across the United States and throughout the field of public health, Black History Month has just begun and this is a time to pay tribute to the contributions and sacrifices that African Americans have made. 
We at the Yale School of Public Health are honored to be able to award this medal to Professor Crenshaw at this time. As you may know, Professor Crenshaw is a co-founder and executive director of the African American Policy Forum, faculty director of the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, and is pioneering scholar and writer on civil rights, critical race theory, black feminist legal scholar, legal theory, sorry, race, racism, and the law. She is the Isidore and Seville Sulzbacher Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and the Promise Institute Chair of Human Rights at UCLA Law School. Professor Crenshaw's work has been foundational in critical race theory and intersectionality. Both of these are terms that she coined. She facilitated the first critical race theory workshop in 1989 and taught the nation's first course on the topic in 1990. Her studies, writing, and activism have identified key issues in the perpetuation of inequality, including the criminalization of black teenage girls. Through a collaboration between the African American Policy Forum and Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies, she has co-authored books, including the book Say Her Name, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women, which documents and draws attention to the killing of black women and girls by the police. Crenshaw and the African American Policy Forum subsequently launched, launched the Say Her Name campaign in 2014 to call attention to police violence against black women and girls. As co-author of Black Girls Matter, Pushed Out, Overpoliced, and Underprotected, her writing has appeared in the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Review, the National Black Law Journal, and the Stanford Law Review. Additionally, uh, she is published in the Southern California Law Review. She is co-editor of Critical Race Theory, key documents that shaped a movement, and assisted on the legal team representing Anita Hill and the confirmation hearing of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. Professor Grenshaw's groundbreaking work on intersectionality was influential in the drafting of the Equality Clause in the South African Constitution. She also coordinated NGO efforts to ensure the inclusion of gender in the World Conference Against Racism Conference Declaration. Her popular podcast, Intersectionally Matters, Intersectionally Matters ranks among the top 5% of podcasts, and she hosts the internet series, Under the Blacklight, the intersectional vulnerabilities that COVID laid bare. She has facilitated workshops for human rights activists in Brazil and India, and for constitutional court judges in South Africa as well. She serves on the Committee on Law and Justice of the National Academy of Science. Among her numerous accolades, she has received Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Association of American Law Schools, Planned Parenthood, the Equal Rights Amendment Coalition, and was voted one of the 10 most important thinkers in the world by Prospect Magazine. Professor Crenshaw was named the recipient of the 2021 Association of American Law Schools Triennial Award for Lifetime Service in Legal Education and to the Legal Profession and is a senior non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute. She also received the 2021 Ruth Bader Ginsburg Lifetime Achievement Award by the Women's Section of the American Law Schools. More than a century after the inception of our school and with communities across the globe facing health inequities in historic proportions, it is fitting that the CEA Winslow Award is given to Professor Kimberly Crenshaw. She's a steadfast pioneer and scholar advocate for social justice and racial equity and an exemplar of the tenacity, creativity, and rigor of Winslow's commitment to interdisciplinary, community-based health for all. The study of the systems and structures that perpetuate the inequities that lead to poor health, comes, health outcomes is a core focus of the faculty, students, and staff at the Yale School of Public Health. Much of the work that our faculty and students do is informed by the theories that Kimberly Crenshaw developed. It is thus an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary honor and privilege for me to present the CEA Winslow Medal to our esteemed guest. Please welcome Professor Kimberly Crenshaw to receive the medal.
Okay, joining us today to lead the discussion with Professor Crenshaw is her colleague, Dr. Daniel Martinez Hosang, Professor of Ethnicity, Race, and Migration in American Studies at Yale. Professor Hosang also holds a secondary appointment in the Department of Political Science and serves on the Education Studies Advisory Committee. His most recent book, A, Wi a Wider Type of Freedom, How Struggle for Racial Justice Liberates Everyone, which was published at the University of California Press in 2021. Professor Hosang is the author or editor of five other books about racial politics and history, social movements, and theories of race and ethnicity, including Seeing Race Again, Countering Color Blindness Across the, the Disciplines with Kimberly Crenshaw, George Lipsitz, and Luke Harris. He has taught seminars for K-12 public school teachers on anti-racist curriculum and pedagogy and works with teachers and youth organizing groups in Connecticut on teaching about racism, racial justice, and the K-12 curriculum through the anti-racist teaching and learning collaboration. Professor Hosang coordinates a research group at Yale examining the long histories of eugenics research and advocacy by Yale faculty in the early, early 20th century and the long impact of that work on the academic disciplines today. Professor Hosang and Crenshaw will explore with us race, intersectionality, and public health, inheritances, insight, and possibilities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hosang. All right, hi everybody. Um, Kim, congratulations. You actually, you get a medal, actually. This is, is <laughs> oh, medal. Yeah. wasn't expecting that. <laughs> um, but I just want to say, you know, before we begin, I, you know, I think oftentimes for these, like, very distinguished and esteemed awards, they're sensibly awarded to figures that have a record of innovation or something on their CV within the discipline, but there's something about conferring the award in recognition of your contribution to public health that is also and this came out in the conversations we had with colleagues in public health yesterday, just the many hundreds and thousands of students and researchers and advocates in the field whose work is strengthened by your scholarship. In other words, it's kind of permeated everywhere. And I think there was just something like kind of profoundly democratic and bottom up about recognizing that work. So I just really want to express my gratitude to colleagues in the School of Public Health. Um, and I'll say a little bit more, I hope, in our conversation. This building has origins in some of uh, Yale's eugenic history, um, and actually as an interdisciplinary center of eugenic thought. So um, and what we, we've talked a lot about how disciplines learn from one another. So it yeah. just seems so fitting that we're celebrating here today the capacity of fields like the law and feminism and black studies having such a profound impact in public health. So congratulations can begin you. on that. Thank you. Um, so what I think many um, uh, folks both in the field, I imagine this auditorium, the people watching our live stream, uh, know you for is your work on intersectionality. And that's a concept that's both, it can be quite easy to grasp and has nuance, complexity, long bodies of uh, uh, genealogies of thought. You've described intersectionality as both a prism and a practice. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you could say more about that and kind of unfold that for a little bit. For I, us. I would love to. Um, so first, I would also uh, like to thank the, the School of Public Health, uh, Dean Pettigrew. Um, the colleagues, uh, the students, I, we had such a wonderful time uh, uh, breaking bread together uh, last night. Um, and I guess I, I have to just say the obvious, it's such a wonderful thing for this to be happening. Um, right now, this week, Black History Month, uh, all of these are, are just uh, uh, um, uh, very powerful confluences uh, of things happening right now, so I very much appreciate it. And wow, I thought five people would be here when I heard the wind this morning, so uh, thank all of you who were able to brave uh, the weather to come out and, and join us for this conversation. Um, so Danny, uh, I've had the occasion mo more now over the last year than ever before to try to explain intersectionality to people who have now for the first time been introduced to it by people who either don't understand it or intentionally um, seek to misrepresent it. Um, uh, I have seen uh, intersectionality be framed as 
um, a static idea, a hierarchy of moral worth, uh, um, a, a, a race for uh, standards and standing, um, things that um, are you know, quite creative uh, adaptations of, of intersectionality. The first thing that I try to um, help uh, people understand to disabuse them of some of the misperceptions around intersectionality is that it is more of a prism and a practice than it is a static idea. Mm -hmm. In fact, the whole point of intersectionality is to invite um, interrogation of how systems continue to work. It's not just a static place. It's not just a, a spot on a, 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 a Venn diagram. Um, it is a way of drawing attention to the dynamics that occur um, and impact people in particular ways, especially people who are subject to multiple forms uh, of discrimination or subordination. So it is an invitation to see um, the interactive effects of the various isms uh, that shape our lives. Uh, it's not an assertion of some essential identitarianism, which again, it's been uh, framed uh, by some of its detractors. And I think perhaps maybe the most surprising thing that I sometimes say, it's a remedial concept. And by remedial, I don't just mean it helps people remedy inequalities that are in existence. But it is remedial in the sense that judges in the 70s and 80s, when they were presented with cases of discrimination uh, raised uh, by African American women, seem to not have the capacity to understand what these women were claiming. So in some of the classic cases that, that I write about in, in uh, demarginalizing the intersection of, of race and sex, um, black women would make a, 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 a credible claim that the industries in which they were um, uh, seeking employment, there were gendered jobs and there were raced jobs. Um, in, in typical kind of industrial uh, uh, places, the jobs for uh, black people and white people were different and the jobs for men and women were different. The, the problem was that many of the jobs for black people were for men, mm -hmm. and many of the jobs for women were for white women. In a, in, in a context like that, when black women were saying, look, this means that there are no real job and career opportunities for us, courts would say, well, you can't prove race discrimination because the employer hires black people, they just happen to be men, and you can't prove gender discrimination because the employer hires women, they just happen to be white. And from the court's perspective, that was sort of the end of the story, right? Um, if you don't experience racism in the same way as men do, then you can't claim race discrimination. If you don't experience gender in the same way that white women do, you can't claim that. Now, as, as a young um, uh, scholar, legal scholar, I couldn't understand what was hard to understand. Right? It just was like, this is not you know, rocket science. It's, it, it, people experience uh, discrimination in different ways uh, depending on a variety of factors. Why is it so hard for judges to figure that out? And then the, the true kicker for me, and probably the thing that drove me to write more about this, is not only did the courts deny African American women the right to make a case of, of compound discrimination, they actually framed their demand as preferential treatment. In other words, if black men don't get to combine two causes of action, um, if white women don't get to combine them, for us to do it for you, black women, is to give you special treatment. So the idea that to give black women what they need to be seen um, is preferential treatment seemed to me to rehearse all of the problematic ways that uh, remedial uh, demands were being framed as preferential. So I called it remedial both in the sense it makes the law work better, but it was a necessary lens or prism for judges that seemed to be out of their element when it came to the claims around black women. So for me, it was simply a matter of coming up with 
uh, an ordinary metaphor, something that people see every day and applying that knowledge to new circumstances. Intersections people go through all the time. They understand that traffic can be overlapping, coming in different directions. So if you interpret tra traffic as power, then power coming in multiple directions will have a particular impact on people who are structurally positioned to receive the impact of both of those different forms mm -hmm. of power. So when I say remedial, it was to help judges see what they apparently um, could not see. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm just also just very struck by your capacity to find metaphors and uh, concepts that are publicly legible, that that's part of the work of scholarship, is to invite people to think with the concept. I think something I've also really learned from that, you know, so many of that piece, and just to, as you say a little more about, is that the critique here was actually the categories of redress. So it wasn't just, I mean, during this time, there's plenty of self-identified conservatives who might want to abolish all civil rights laws. You didn't actually train your attention for this piece there. Um, it's actually about the remedies that are inadequate. And you end the piece by saying, look, these remedies limit all, all of our efforts to make employment decent and fair and dignified. So could you say a little bit more, and maybe this gets us into some of the kind of um, commitments of critical race theory about trying to interrogate not simply the, you know, the people who kind of present themselves as opponents, mm -hmm. but actually the seemingly liberal race neutral sites that are supposed to be doing the work that, you know, you're yeah. calling them to do. Well, um, you know, it, 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 until recently, I, I, I didn't think that what you just mm -hmm. pointed out was an important thing to remind people of because effectively, um, um, demarginalizing, mapping the margins, all of these pieces were basically written, um, taken as a given, uh, the commitment to um, remedy the impact of structural forms of exclusion. The idea was that if we take um, the, the imperative uh, to create racially just uh, workforces, if we take seriously the imperative uh, to create gender equity in workforces, then we need to take seriously intersectionality. So the idea wasn't to fight about whether we thought gender equity or race uh, justice were legitimate, uh, actionable values. Right. Taking those commitments seriously means that you also have to take then intersectionality seriously. So it presumed we were talking in a community um, that shared that yeah. value and then here is a prism or a tool to help us actualize um, those values. Um, in demarginalizing, I also acknowledged um, what I think at the end of the day, the intervention helped us reveal, which is that the legal subject, the imaginary you know, uh, a plaintiff, the imaginary person, uh, is not simply a neutral um, person. There's not the you know, sort of standard, we're just gonna take the individual. Um, the law's subject is both racialized and gendered. In other words, the law subject is a white male. How and why did I come to that conclusion? Well, it didn't escape me that the very argument that the courts were using against allowing black women to make a claim of, of, of discrimination was exactly the argument that the courts were accepting with increasing regularity when it came to white male plaintiffs who were challenging affirmative action. Yeah. The structure of their argument was exactly the same. So when, when uh, uh, industry and uh, higher education adopted affirmative action programs, it was usually uh, a program that included race and gender. The point was to try to diversify on, on both grounds. What that effectively meant for plaintiffs who were arguing reverse discrimination uh, was that they were saying these programs discriminate against me as a white male. Mm -hmm. It's the same mm -hmm. argument. Right, right. Um, and courts did not say, well, no, 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 right. no. You can't prove gender discrimination one, yeah. because the program does um, include mm -hmm. men of color and you can't prove race discrimination because it does mm -hmm. uh, include uh, white women. It just 
Not only did they not accept that argument, no one thought it was an argument that needed to be made, yeah. right? Prove that you've been experiencing race discrimination. Prove that you've been experiencing gender discrimination. And, and, and that was just a little window. There are these moments where you can see how law is really functioning to back up the status quo. Um, the fact that no one saw that but yet black women's claims were seen as extraordinary, demands for preferential treatment. It suggested that what was happening to white male plaintiffs was seen as discrimination because of pre-existing presumptions about how they're supposed to be treated, what they have reason to expect, whereas the, the cases uh, around black women um, were not those kind of cases. Um, the closest analogy that I can come to, just another window, um, that allows you to see how race and gender is already there in the baseline assumptions of law is the fact that um, if, a, if a white person at law was mistakenly called um, a Negro at the time uh, by the newspapers, they could get damages because they've suffered a legal injury. Black people could not get damages if they were mistakenly called white. If anything, people probably thought, you know, you should, you should pay them mm -hmm. for calling you white because you've gotten racial capital that you don't have a right to. Mm -hmm. So there are these different moments, like intersectionality, where you can see that the law, uh, its starting position is not neutral. Mm -hmm. It is already race, it's already gendered, and those subjects are able to make claims far more readily than those who have not been imagined to be the citizen. They're not the legal subject. You have to fight your way first into being seen as a legal subject, and then you get a chance, if you're recognized as a legal subject, to fight for um, legal interests or for your rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just want to say this is, you know, a, a significant part of critical race theory. Its periodization is it's emerging after civil rights anti-discrimination laws have been passed. And the argument was the remedy is there, the tools are there. Maybe we need to give it some time for the litigation to work itself out. But we have everything we need. And so this work is so critical in asking the, the question that we always ask, how is it that 50 years after these laws, the forms of hierarchy and domination and violence are still so acute and structural. And your point is, it's not just residual chauvinism, bigotry, you know, ghosts of the past. It's actually baked in to the very structures that promised um, a, a solution. Yes. I wonder if we might think now about in the field, so the African American Policy Forum that you direct has done a lot of work around black women's health, around the impact of these systems that are presenting themselves clearly as not just kind of race neutral, but the site at which people's health can be addressed. Mm -hmm. And you've um, helped us understand the ways that um, the, it, it perpetuates and extends these uh, inequalities. Could you say a little bit more about that work and maybe help us think about yeah. how we apply intersectionality in those settings? Yes, yeah. Um, and and, and let, me, let me get to that through the, the door that you opened about you know, 50 years yeah. after Brown, because um, when, when those of us who ultimately went on to write in the field that is now called critical race theory um, and in the field of intersectionality, we were um, the children of the civil rights generation. We were the ones that watched it on TV. Um, we were, some of us were the first or you know, second classes of, of, of students coming through the new ethnic studies programs. I graduated uh, from Africana Studies at Cornell, um, a, a program that was brought into existence because of student activism, because of demands that said, when we come to the university, that's just the first layer. Um, there's more that needs to be done. When we're brought into these spaces, we have to really think about the arrangements. We have to think about the furniture. Yeah. We have to think about what the institution is there for, what it does, what, how it rationalizes um, existing patterns of social inequity. That's one of the uh, topics of our book uh, together that looked at the ways that the disciplines themselves uh, were sites of racial subordination, um, histories that have been buried but nonetheless continue to express themselves in the values of the disciplines and the tools and, and the practices and what's valued, what's considered meritocratic in the various disciplines. All of this was established 
at a time where there were beliefs across the board and natural hierarchies of races, natural hierarchies uh, of, of, of sex, um, uh, the erasure of gender, all of these things were built into, as you say, baked in from the beginning. So when we start coming into these institutions, the question is, are we coming into these institutions to be shaped by the same dynamics that rationalize our exclusion in the right. first place? Or does our presence mean something about the substance of what's being done, the work that's what that's being done, and the, the function of the university? So um, many of us who came through these programs when these questions were being asked, who learned a, a, a broader, deeper history uh, about the role of knowledge production institutions in shaping the terms of our lives outside of those institutions, then went on to law schools and various other places with this sense that, number one, um, our presence gives us a right to something more than the standard stuff that had gone on before. Um, and number two, our role um, as, 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 as students um, in these institutions was to uh, gather the resources that should be available and put them yeah. to the use yeah. uh, of, our, of our various communities to perfect um, the, the, the long-term process of, of achieving a truly multiracial democracy. So when, when we went yeah. to Harvard yeah. you know, uh, Law School, many of us came there to study with Derrick Bell. Mm -hmm. He was you know, known as the person who was asking exactly the same questions that we were asking in African-American studies, asking mm -hmm. it uh, in the law, and that was a fundamentally different kind of uh, set of questions. Many times, uh, law professors and, and, and legal scholars wouldn't ask questions about what is the distributive consequence of this legal rule on particular populations. That was verboten, right, right, right. right? Even though in reality that's what they were doing, you don't have to name populations when it's the dominant populations. Right. It, it's just, you know, you're, you're choosing uh, between various kinds of public policy. We were recognizing that the choices that were made by judges made a difference in our lives. Mm -hmm. So that's where the idea, you know, came from of being um, uh, taking the recognition that race is not biological, mm -hmm. race is not real, but race is materially real, law has everything to do with creating that materiality mm -hmm. and everything to do with rationalizing it once it has created mm -hmm. these material outcomes. So we, we were writing and doing all this stuff for, you know, you know, this stuff has been around for 40 years, yeah, right? Yeah. So we were doing it for a while before it dawned on us that we could write a thousand law review articles. Mm -hmm. But unless the information about how law played a role in shoring up an inequitable status quo was made available to more people, then this invisible uh, legitimizer would continue. And, and we came to that awareness after the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill um, uh, um, debacle, I will say it. Um, and so that's when we decided to, to uh, make um, an institution that was more or less um, a gateway institution that took ideas, uh, made them available to uh, constituencies, taking some of the issues that constituencies had and bringing them back mm -hmm. in. Um, Afri the African American Policy Forum was co-founded by uh, Luke Charles Harris and myself to do precisely that work. As we moved from um, the late 90s to the early aughts, much of the debate in the 90s was now taking hold. So a lot of the debate in the 90s was, um, do we still have a racial problem, and if so, what it is? Mm -hmm. And you know, the truth of the matter is that the shift away from structural explanations right. happened in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, moderate institutions and liberals got on board with mm -hmm. that idea um, in the 90s, and one of the ways they got on board with it was understanding uh, racial disparity to be the product of deficits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not in institutions, right. Right. Uh, not in our social order, but in the body yeah. or in the community or in the family. And so once you've been able to shift responsibility for racial injustice to those who are excluded or marginalized, 
you're well along the way of saying, so therefore we don't need to talk about structural injustice. We don't need to talk about uh, law. We don't need to have critical perspectives. All we need to do is figure out how to fix these people. And it turns out the people that they were most interested in fixing were men. They were boys. And the fix was um, a, a bipartisan frame by basically saying, um, if you care about crime, then you should join this effort to fix the boys. If you care about the boys, you should join this effort to fix the boys. And girls just fell out. Mm -hmm. Girls were not part of the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. Girls were not part of the epidemic of violence. Um, reproductive uh, uh, consequences of, of being a black woman, having uh, a child in a country where you're almost four times more likely to die, not part of the race problem. So we turned our attention to try to elevate that, to show not only um, that black girls were experiencing disparities relative to white girls that in some ways were greater than the disparities that black boys were experiencing relative to white boys, when it comes to suspension, when it comes to expulsion. We were looking at New York and right. the expulsion data was so racially disparate that in the year we looked at it, we, we, to even come up with a ratio, we had to make up a white girl who was expelled right. from school. Yeah. Um, and when we did that, it was a one to 53 ratio. I mean, yeah. basically that, that's how disparate the treatment of black girls was relative to white girls. But across the board, these disparities um, have been erased because we have a non-intersectional view of what racial disparity looks like. It focuses exclusively, uh, largely, when we're talking about crime, when we're talking about uh, mass incarceration, when we're talking about police brutality, when we're talking about surveillance, the, the notion is that this is exclusively a black male problem. Mm. And so we needed to figure out ways to, number one, bring new information into the conversation, and number two, help people understand why it is that black women were disappearing from our racial justice analysis. Mm. It, it wasn't just we don't care about them. It's that our prisms, our tools were not fitted so we could actually see how racism was playing out across right. gender. Right. So that's where a lot of the, the work came from and of course, it does amplify public health concerns, mm -hmm. both in the, in the sense that racism is a public health issue, which would mean that in order to address it fully, we have to have an intersectional frame mm -hmm. to understand racism as a public uh, health issue. Um, and, and just also in, in terms of how data is collected and represented. Race is not the, the factor, racism right, is the right, factor. Right, right, right. And public health helps us make that adjustment from thinking that the, the, the disparity is in the body and, and not in the system, in the society, in the economy, um, and in the culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think we have about 10 more minutes and then we'll, we'll have some time to open it up for questions. I wanted to just uh, ask you a question about the disciplines and then maybe talk about the, the teaching and, and all the, um, the struggles around the College Board's AP uh, African American History class. Let me take a drink. Yeah. <laughs> Only water, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, it's water. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So when you, you, know, you were talking about the individual subject of the law, um, and we think about criminal adjudication, that's the side of it, right? What, what's, what, what are the offenses? What's offensive about the offender, mm -hmm. et cetera? In psychology, in social psychology, the individual unit of analysis, what varies and different, right? The body is a kind of vector, what makes this body different even in public health? Mm -hmm. So you made this point when you brought a whole range of scholars together almost 15 years ago now to say, I want you to listen to each other, how you're talking about the problems in your discipline, and you had to do a lot of work to say, we need to listen now, <laughs> uh, listen to each other and find out those similarities, mm -hmm. both so we can have an, a more structural account of why the disciplines do this, and so we have a set of tools mm -hmm. to respond. So I'm thinking now of students in public health and the health sciences and younger scholars who are thinking about what are the tools beyond, as you said, representation, maybe questions of, you know, internalized bias, mm -hmm. but that allow us to focus on the conventions that can make us feel like, as you were suggesting, we have claims on this discipline, mm -hmm. and we have actually a vision for it that exceeds 
what it's been in the past. Yeah. So can you say yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah. You know, uh, Danny, it, it reminds me, uh, one of the uh, uh, participants in, in this uh, project that we yeah. had uh, was Claude Steele. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he gave us the tagline. He said, uh, we are looking for people who pray to their disciplinary gods with one eye open. Right, that's right. Namely, um, those who are, are able to um, uh, uh, deliver some of the tools um, of their discipline, but are not bound by the limitations of those disciplines. So for us, uh, interdisciplinary work um, is we are all training our attention on a set of questions. And in that instance, yeah. we were all thinking about colorblindness, um, how colorblindness um, uh, erases the, the, the histories of our various disciplines, how they um, limit the ability to interrogate uh, colorblindness uh, and the work that it's doing, and also how we can use some of our tools once they have been um, distilled uh, and, and, and um, segmented away from this uh, boundedness to yeah. colorblindness to actually help us uh, create a, a narrative, an account, a story um, that tells the truth about um, how our uh, social order has been created, how it has been justified, and how that process is still the work of supremacies mm -hmm. of various yeah. sorts, right? So when we talk about white supremacy or patriarchy, we're not exclusively talking about individuals uh, with uh, bad yeah, attitudes, right? right? right, right. Uh, we're talking about uh, the various ways that the starting positions of the institutions and the disciplines um, that we function uh, within uh, hold as a given a certain set of assumptions. And those assumptions are themselves socially created. They, they, are, they are not neutral, they are not transhistorical, they are not natural. They are what we call constructed. Yeah. So many of the tools that are part of the, the critical template, they are part of uh, uh, African American studies, they are part of queer studies. These studies are the product of applying the tools, the interrogating of the starting positions yeah. to show what happens when you shift from the idea that the body is male and then women are studied in a separate course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, our history is white and everyone else's history is studied in a separate course. These are the, the kind of moves that uh, critical thinking helps people to make and it's precisely the reason why um, these, uh, these tools un are under so much pressure mm -hmm. today. And um, for those of us at Yale and who are in the auditorium not watching, when you leave this building, just because it's a, a, an object lesson in this, you'll see on the entrance in the Iron Gate and in the Freeze a title that says Institute of Human Relations, which was founded by, this building was built and funded by them, this side of the building, um, uh, with support of the Rockefeller Foundation, to enact a kind of clinical interdisciplinary practice that would allow people from a broad range of fields to observe human difference and theorize the role of biology in doing that. Mm -hmm. And we all walk by this. Uh, um, we don't know what it actually means or stands for, but it's a reminder of a kind of absent presence that needs interrogation. Otherwise, it seems unremarkable. Well, and, and you know, just, just to um, think forward a little bit, you know, the tendency is, and, and I would say the, the demands now that, that are being made to uh, tell history in a certain way is to acknowledge perhaps that as an ancient sure. history. Yeah. Thank God we're beyond that. That's right. uh, and along with that, distancing is the failure often to see contemporary versions yeah. Yeah. of that. So we don't do the phrenology thing sure. anymore. Right. You know, we, we don't we do the do nose yeah. thing anymore. But we do do standardized tests. Yeah. And they are standardized to something, yeah. right? Yeah. And the validation of those tests function in the same way that the validation of phrenology did, yeah, right? Yeah. So we're gonna take whatever uh, 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 way that we can quantify difference, and if those differences map on to social hierarchies, then we assume that those differences are, are the cause of the yeah. social hierarchy, yeah. right? Yeah. The same thing is happening with yeah. standardized tests, yeah. right? Yeah. Rather than seeing what goes into yeah. standardized to what, right? right? And when you start thinking and looking into 
um, standardized tests, you see um, that questions that black students do well on relative to white students, they get you know, kicked out of the mm -hmm. test. Uh, uh, tests, uh, questions that women do better on uh, than men kicked out of the test. So the actual creation of that measurement is itself a reflection of the hierarchies that are already there. So if they reproduce them, they're not telling you something about who's inherently more qualified. What they're telling you is the measure that's built out of hierarchy, surprise, surprise, will reproduce that hierarchy. Yes. Yeah. That we should have learned from the past. The challenge is, can we take those lessons from the past and and, and, and interrogate the practices that we take as a given in the present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And trace their history in our disciplines. Uh, okay, last question before we open it up, and so we're talking about standardized testing, and that leads us to the College Board, um, which administers standardized tests broadly, and, um, uh, and its recent decision to, after 10 years of developing, in collaboration, an AP course in African American history, um, uh, to essentially accede to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his Department of Education's demand that the course be stripped of a whole range of critical content. Uh, and we'll, this is, we'll be talking about this today at four o'clock at a, a kind of teach-in at Loose Hall. But I, I just, for our purposes here, one might think of this, well, this is you know, clearly regrettable, but these are the theatrics one expects when we're thinking about electoral politics and it's come and I, it's just too bad, but it probably doesn't have much to do with us here. Mm -hmm. um, can you just walk us through just a little bit in closing, what is the connection between that and what we're talking about today? Mm, yeah, well, um, it, it, it's, been, it's, been a, it's, it's been a week. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a week. So this was uh, announced the day before yesterday uh, that uh, many of the topics that um, have uh, invoke the ire of the um, anti-CRT, anti-woke, anti-structural racism, anti-DEI crew um, have now uh, been taken out of uh, required uh, uh, reading, required topics, and placed into uh, uh, optional um, coursework. Um, much of the um, impetus uh, at least from, I think, uh, student demand for this course came out of the contemporary yeah, yeah. Um, um, issues. As you point out, this course has been uh, thought about for 10 years, uh, but um, it's not an accident that the uh, uh, moment of the twin uh, pandemic that we've right. talked about before, uh, the, the uh, uh, racial violence um, uh, that took George Floyd's life and Breonna Taylor was one pandemic and of course COVID was the other and it drove you know millions of people into the street across the country and honestly you know across the world in every state in the union there were protests and these protests were not just people of color mm -hmm. these protests involved white people young people who were demanding explanations for why after uh, decades of so-called racial progress, they could still turn on their uh, television and, and look on their cell phones and see a black man literally being murdered by police. What explains this? Why do we still have it? And of course, you know, corporations and foundations across the country, you know, jumped in and said, yes, the time is now. Um, we are standing behind and we're all for, you know, racial justice. So of course, you know, doors were open to things that you know had been on a slow burner uh, for uh, some time um, and uh, one of the things uh, that uh, now has emerged from this is this AP course well um, as it turns out the, the things that drove that demand uh, are the things that are no longer required so movement for black lives no longer uh, a reading or, or a, a, a unit that is required um, queer studies no longer required uh, intersectionality um, went from being mentioned many times to one time um, and so on and so forth so you know I I'm not here to say uh, exactly um, uh, what the college board, uh, uh, what, what they did or did not do. I will say that it is an unfortunate coincidence at best, mm -hmm. I'll put it that way, that the same material uh, that 
Ron DeSantis and others didn't want is material that there was no time for, mm -hmm. uh, no time for an in-depth uh, interrogation. Um, I think we should be concerned about this, uh, not just because you know, you know, certain uh, writers are, are no longer required. In fact, what uh, the College Board has done is eliminated all secondary material. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is a, a huge concern. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you make sense out of these issues without the grammar to put it together? I, I often say that this is like uh, teaching people the alphabet, maybe showing them how to sound out a couple words, but when it comes to putting together sentences that deliver meaning, they're like, well, now you're on your own on yeah, that. Yeah. You can figure that out yourself. Well, you don't figure it out. Yeah. Uh, yourself. You need to have the materials that show the links between, say, you know, how college uh, and grade school textbooks for most of the you know, 20th century were shaped by um, a, a, an argument about enslavement and reconstruction that was basically the lost cause. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that, that slavery wasn't so bad and Reconstruction was terrible. Um, th these are ideas that were shaped by a dedicated small group of people in a particular region, you know, of the country that then got broadcast across all of them because textbooks and, and, and other institutions had to or felt they had to abide by the lowest common denominator. So all of us were miseducated yeah. because some subset refuse to actually teach about the Civil War, teach about enslavement, genocide, in, in a way that actually was a straightforward look at what the realities were and what the ideologies that supported these were. So if you, if you don't have that information, you're unlikely to be able to see the possibility that we're heading down a similar path today. And that may be the point mm -hmm. of not having that information. You know that statement uh, that, that those who don't know history are bound to repeat it. Um, I'll add to that, um, the, the, what, what all it takes for um, evil to, to win is for people of goodwill to do nothing yeah. um, or to abide by it um, or to abet it. So I would say that the real challenge for us right now are not the not the DeSantis of the mm -hmm. world. They, they're going to do what they're going to sure. do. Um, the question is whether our institutions will hold, if our institutions will see the consequences of books being burned uh, basically, it's the, uh, the equivalent of taking them out of the libraries, courses not being offered, teachers being surveilled, um, uh, entire boards of trustees being taken over, uh, colleges basically being colonized by um, uh, a, an insist, a group insisting on one story being told, yeah. a celebratory story story being told and effectively wiping out the last half of, of the 20th century in the first quarter of the 21st century. Um, so, you know, my, my sense is that this is a fight for um, democracy. It's a fight for um, the values that we claim to hold dear. Um, the, 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 the trouble is always in the details. Everybody says we support it, but now's the time to really determine whether that support means that we're going to say no uh, to this censorship and yes to continuing the process of democratizing our education to democratize our country. Mm -hmm. Well, before we turn it over to some questions, I hope that we still have time. I just want to say, Kim, like, whenever we're in conversation like this, I'm, I, I, it just reminds me of your points about a prism and a practice, right? As we talk about events and ideas and try to make sense of them, that that's what the tools give us, that they're alive, yeah? that we keep having to uh, nourish them. And precisely what you're talking about, what was taken away, was in some ways a prism, you know, and they named that. They, you know, it's actually not the content. So they even said, I don't know, teach the Panthers if you want. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the prism that's at stake, and it goes right back to what you said. So I'm grateful to be in conversation with you during this uh, period, Always, and I just Danny. want to thank you. Yeah, Always, thank you.
we have a time for a few questions. If people are, or want, they can come to the either end and uh, to, the, to the microphones. I'll start, Kim, you can have your mm -hmm. water first. But I want to kind of end it on the uh, follow up on the last question that Daniel was, was posing about uh, about kind of the current challenge. And so originally, you know, a lot of the work you were doing was kind of trying to help people see kind of the importance of intersectionality and the importance of, yeah, but now there seems to be like an active fight. Not only do you need to do that still, that, that, but there's also like an active fight against some of these concepts. And so do you see the, the uh, what are the challenges or what is the different approach like, do you see a different way to handling kind of more of the active challenging against these, uh, the, the implementation of these concepts versus more like helping people see and implement the concepts mm, in general? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm also going to welcome my, my colleague Danny into this conversation <laughs> at this point as well. Um, so I, I would say, I mean, there are multiple aspects of the challenge, but I, I'll elevate to... Um, I, th I think that the increasing corporatization of higher education means that um, the bottom line uh, may be more of a, um, a, a lead weight on our aspirations than, than ever before. Um, and I don't mean to create a, a sense that, well, in uh, years ago we weren't tied to um, sort of corporatization. What I do mean, though, is that, as all of us know as, as scholars, we are increasingly, you know, being told that we are independent contractors, right? If we want to do a project, a conference, uh, a reception, where's the money for it, right? There is a, there is a sense that everything has to be um, if not profit making, at least not you know spending against um, uh, money that that hasn't come in from from elsewhere. So that creates a vulnerability uh, for uh, institutions that are at the same time uh, being pressed by those who have decided that the, the next battleground is this institution. If you have the power of the checkbook, or at least the threat uh, of the checkbook, that's going to create audiences for you that you might not have had before. Audiences for people who are saying things that um, administrators, presidents know to be untrue, but again, the logics um, are, are obviously uh, uh, changing the, 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 the receptivity of, of some of these ideas. So um, that's problem number one, and I would say problem number two, honestly, is also the corporatization of our media. Um, so media uh, reporting these days on such controversial issues amounts to um, Senator A says that the sun rises in the West. Um, and uh, uh, academic uh, B says, no, that's not true at all. And everyone knows that's not true. Well, there you have it. Uh, that, that's it, <laughs> right? So, so there's, there's really uh, very little uh, uh, serious effort to do the work of understanding where um, these uh, demands are coming from, how they're being funded, what agendas are being advanced, um, and, and, and how the institution uh, that, that we are in here and others are, are being affected by that. So um, uh, when, when you have such an asymmetry uh, happening, when you have such coordination, um, you have a desire to attack things uh, and, and, and uh, transgress uh, traditional rules, and the other side doesn't know what to do or is stuck in a matrix of, well, I guess we have to you know, tolerate this stuff because to do otherwise is for us to be political. Um, it, it's, a losing, it's a losing scenario. So when, when you say, how do we do it, you know, I try to basically bring the tools uh, that we've brought all along. Let, let's, uh, let's look at what the uh, idea about neutral reporting actually uh, facilitates. Let's show that it's not really neutral at all. Let's show uh, what happens when um, 
a course is, is, is potentially uh, uh, watered down in order to ensure that uh, all 50 states will adopt it when uh, a good uh, uh, half of those states have already said that there are a range of ideas that they will no longer tolerate, right? That, that means that the fight is already uh, clearly and totally in balance, and we've got to be able to see the whole of it uh, before you know, um, uh, we basically say it's un unwinnable. We've got to know what we're fighting in order to, to win. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, quickly, I, I, you've made this point that these attacks are often tests to see if we go after this group, will, can we, can we, will they disavow them, right? Will they view them as, I didn't care much for the work anyway, I didn't quite understand it, and maybe if we just jettison them, we can get back to doing our work, uh, and we'll accept that proposition. And what happens time and time again is you've set up the very basis mm -hmm. for which they'll come for you next critiquing the whole sense that a university is simply self-interested, not capable of producing knowledge that benefits broad publics, and therefore now you have to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think they're building on those fissures because they understand the, the d divisions even within our institutions. Mm -hmm. you have a question? Yeah. I think it's on. Yeah. Maybe turn it on. Is it on? Is it on? Is it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to say it is an honor to hear you speak live. I've seen so many of your TED Talks and videos, and it's just such an honor. Um, I, my question is, do you have any advice for future medical students entering education that is known to have teachings that are extremely biased in terms of, do you want me to start again? Do you, I heard the first part. Do I have okay. any advice for yeah, medical for students? Yeah, for future medical students entering uh, education that the teachings are known to be extremely biased in terms of racial and gender understandings and how to fight those biases as a student. Thank you. E excellent, excellent question. Um, so one of the things I always try to do is stay in my lane. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> And uh, part, of, part of staying in my lane is sometimes, you know, telling my war stories that you might get, you know, some, um, you know, see some parallels with because while I completely accept the, the premise that there are biases in medical education and probably all, I couldn't tell you exactly, you know, what they are and therefore, you know, how to fight them. But here's what I'll say about my own experience as a law student. Um, we uh, came into law school with expectations. When we saw that those expectations were not being met, we thought, as consumers, we have a right <laughs> to say, look, this product is not serving us so well. <laughs> you, 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 you've got to send this back and make some adjustments. And the thing that was, I think, um, uh, 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 the, the, the moment of sort of the, the, the creation of the movement that would ultimately come was not just when we went in to say, here are all the things we were expecting to learn. These, and this is the mission of the institution. You are not serving it. The aha moment is when the institution spoke back to us to justify the picture that we had painted. When you get the institution to speak and rationalize that which you find to be intolerable, that then becomes um, legible for uh, activation, negotiation, uh, um, other, other forms of activism. As long as you're just arguing about the picture, we don't have this course, uh, we don't have this exposure, then there can be m multiple ways in which institutions continue to just do what they do because, you know, they don't have to account for it. But once the accountability is articulated, the attempt is articulated, then that gives you the material from which to actually then begin the fight. So for us, critical race theory actually jumped off when our dean told us that there were no qualified black people in the country to come and teach at Harvard Law School. So that, that opened up the whole door. Well, what counts as qualification? Are you saying that all the people who were engaged in 
the legal revolution that created the civil rights movement are not qualified to come to Harvard Law School. And these people who know one section of the tax code, and that's all they've studied since they were, you know, 25 years old, they are qualified to lead the law school of the next, you know, century. That just gives you the, the material uh, to, to, to fight, the terms of the fight. Um, the ideologies and, and, and the practices that those, those terms um, justify. So I don't know how that translates, you know, for, for med, uh, med school students. I would imagine there is a way, but that I think is what's up to you. But Danny? Well, and just to point to your essay in this volume we have together called Seeing Race Again, which is available everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but in this, Kim recounts the call. It's a kind of a bit of a blow by blow. First we said this, then they did this, then we did this collaboratively. But it's meant to be a certain kind of, certainly not a template, but one example of how a certain kind of insurgency reached critical mass, found a shared vocabulary, and then we see it in other, in social psychology and music and other disciplines mm -hmm. that have staged kind of similar uh, confrontations and envisioning of new possibilities. And I'll just say it seems like the time is so right in medicine for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's already taken place, but to repeat the same thing. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I think we have one more. Got it? Hello. Oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Professor Crenshaw, thank you so much for coming. I've been reading your work since high school, so thank you so much. It's such an honor to hear you speak. Um, one of your pieces that really sp stuck with me was your piece on the Two Life crew and like beyond misogyny and racism. Um, and I was wondering, when you're looking at the violence that black women experience from all different fronts, from white people, from black people, how do you view that violence as intersectional specifically when talking about black men and the misogyny that we experience and how black women read statistics for sexual assault, rape, domestic violence? How are you, do you reconcile that as an intersectional lens? And uh, because, you know, both parties are black in this situation. Um, and I just wondered how, you, if you could speak more about that because I really love that piece. Thank okay. you so much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for bringing up, um, bringing up that article. Um, uh, it, was, it was a piece of uh, the um, Mapping the Margins um, article that happens to be one of the materials that was in the, the first version of the uh, African American AP course that no longer is there. Um, so um, yes, I do see uh, violence uh, uh, against black women uh, as intersectional in, in several ways. One of the things that I was doing uh, in, in mapping the margins was to uh, draw attention to the various ways in which violence um, had been um, gendered and racialized in, in different ways. So uh, racist violence had been long gendered as um, uh, lynching, uh, violence uh, against uh, black people who are men. And uh, gender-based violence had long been framed as, um, you know, more or less, uh, it's something that it impacts all women. Um, and uh, the various differences uh, uh, were um, irrelevant to understanding the dynamics of it. And so the point of the article was to trace what some of the consequences of those sort of mutually exclusive framings uh, actually were for women of color who were uh, experiencing various forms of violence. So um, the, the point was uh, both to say that uh, the way and the context in which violence is experienced it is always uh, grounded, uh, always informed by the context in which is experienced, and consequently, um, the failure of these two mutually exclusive frames to anticipate that some of the women experiencing violence will be non-white, and some of the people of color experiencing violence will be women, 
is that the actual circumstances that they face are going to be exacerbated by the failures of these these two you know frames which in turn were, were part of movements so concretely it meant you know um, uh, when black women were were raped, many of the rape crisis shelters that served African American women um, were underfunded because the funding strategy uh, was based on court accompaniment. But black women are disproportionately unlikely to see their assailants arrested, prosecuted, and convicted. So by that measure, the court accompaniment was not going to actually address uh, what the needs of black women survivors of rape actually were. Similarly, on, on the uh, question of uh, intimate partner violence, a lot of shelters you know, had no uh, recognition that a lot of the people coming through their door would need different kind of services. So I tell a story about uh, a Spanish-speaking woman who called repeatedly to a shelter because her husband was trying to kill her. And the women at the shelter were debating whether they could service her because she didn't speak English. And having someone translate for her meant that she wouldn't be able to become self-actualized, right? So um, how is it that a, um, a, a remedy is, uh, is so uh, uh, missing the mark? It's missing the mark because the original conceptualization of what the problem was was a non-intersectional one. So I wrote that article not basically just to talk about a theory. Yes, there's a theory, but the theory is everybody needs to be served and people are not being served because the conceptualization is so narrow. That is what, what is behind uh, Two Live Crew, the whole point there you know, being that trying to defend Two Live Crew's misogyny um, as cultural is accepting African-American culture as inherently misogynistic. Um, and it is not. It has um, been allowed to be framed as such by those who uh, were trying to defend Two Live Crew against what was admittedly actually a racist prosecution. So it's a complex um, uh, circumstance that needed an intersectional lens to say, you can say the prosecution is racist without saying that misogyny is cultural. All right, last question. Hi, Dr. Crenshaw. Thank you so much for such an amazing and thought-provoking conversation today. Um, my question is about at the start of the conversation when you were talking about some of the critics of intersectionality and even later on when we talked about news media framing and how we often present both sides but just stop there and not try to find a middle ground. So my question is about finding that middle ground. So when you're approaching these kind of conversations with people who have different frameworks or even frameworks that go to attack intersectionality, how do you approach those kind of conversations and try to mediate productive discourse with people with opposing viewpoints as your own, in your own experience? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I'll say that everything to, to me is context dependent, right? There, there are some things for, for which middle grounding uh, might make sense and other things in, for which middle grounding uh, doesn't m make sense. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really think there's a, a middle ground to, I don't know, uh, discussing whether the Supreme Court was right to say that African Americans, since they were enslaved people, would never be citizens of this democracy and thus had no rights that white people were bound to respect. Um, that, that was wrong when he said it. Um, it's wrong now. Um, and I think it's wrong um, uh, when efforts to effectively create uh, a, a regime of rights in, in which uh, rights to ra against racial discrimination are not enforceable. Um, so I don't, I'm not always looking actually for middle ground. Um, uh, I think that there are other things that uh, are middle groundable. Um, but often I think what the, the search for the middle ground is, uh, is, is in this moment, uh, a way of not confronting the fact that we are, we are moving without many guardrails to a society in which 
I, I'll say it. Um, we have authoritarian um, uh, dimensions to it. We're, we're moving to a, a, a place where there's an official story. And I don't think there should be a middle ground on whether there should be an official story that is imposed on public institutions, that is imposed uh, on, on, our common, uh, on our common welfare. So um, I, I think the challenge for those of us who believe in public goods, who believe in public institutions, who believe in public health, our challenge is to figure out how do we respond to those who deny that there's any such thing and any effort to create laws, policies, and practices to protect the public good or the public wealth, uh, public health, um, are violations of our freedom. I, I, think, I think we are at a point where we still haven't calculated the harm that was created in the COVID moment by people claiming that basic public health measures violate their freedom. I don't think we've actually seen the end to this. And so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm not thinking that our main challenge is how do we modify that? I, I'm thinking our main challenge is how do we understand where this idea came from, how it was generated, how it has now effectively, my sense is that that side is kind of one. I mean, I'm glad to be in a place like this where, you know, people still recognize there's something going on out there. Um, but I think from the highest levels, the, the idea that we can't now afford to take public health seriously um, um, has led to a moment where now there aren't even resources anymore for uh, making sure that everyone has access to uh, what they need to protect themselves against COVID. So I just would be a little careful um, about what we sometimes call the both sidesism, you know, approach. Um, I think that's been a weapon that has made it difficult for us to see the crises that we're in and to aggregate the resources, both financial but also um, uh, uh, in, uh, group based resources, the common vocabulary to be able to address the crises we're in right now. Thank you for the question. Okay, thank you, Professor Crenshaw and Professor Hosang. This was absolutely inspiring, and I think you've given us a lot to think about, and I think all of us in the audience will walk away from here um, thinking about how we can reframe our thinking and apply it to improving public health. So really appreciate that. So thank you all for coming. This has been an historic event. Um, we invite you to join us outside for a reception afterwards if you can stay for a few minutes. Um, and we'll see you outside. Thank you. Thank you.